So hey everyone again, uh, super excited to introduce uh, Michael Siebel who's a partner at Y Combinator. Um, Michael has done pretty much everything there is to do in Silicon Valley. Um, he came out here 2006, I want to say, to start Justin.tv uh, with a couple of other Yaleys. Um, they ran that for a couple of years and then actually split the company into two. One company was SocialCam, uh, which went on to sell to Autodesk for $60 million. The other one was Twitch, which sold to Amazon for a billion dollars two years ago. Um, and then he moved on to be a full-time partner at Y Combinator and has been, you know, there's like awesome stories that I kind of want to get into. Uh, the introducing Airbnb to Y Combinator, um, the Justin.TV mafia, and there's like so much more that we can sort of dig into. But I think uh, it's just an honor to be here uh, being able to interview uh, Michael. So maybe we could just start with, uh, you just give a little background about, you know, you're at Yale, it's like mid-2000s and you graduate. And then, like, how did you end up in Silicon Valley? Um, so, I didn't like going to class at all. I was on the five-year plan at Yale. I was kicked out and told to come back after I figured out how to participate a little bit more, uh, a little bit less on having fun, a little bit more academically. Um, I was a poli-sci major. Uh, I can honestly say I academically learned almost nothing, but being kicked out allowed me to come back to Yale uh, in the class of 2005 and become friends uh, with this guy named Justin Kahn, who comes up with crazy startup ideas. Um, that was basically my Yale experience in a nutshell. And uh, I left Yale to work on a political campaign. Uh, well, I graduated, then worked on a political campaign for a year. And then uh, Justin said he was going to start a company to broadcast his life 24-7 by putting a camera on his head. And he asked me if, he thought, if I thought that was a good idea. Yes, yeah, we were having dinner with his dad. And we both said that was a really stupid idea <laughs> and uh, went on with our lives. Um, it turns out the campaign, um, we lost. We lost by three percentage points. I was the head fundraiser for the campaign, and it was a U.S. Senate campaign. So... I should have really known it wasn't going to go well, but uh, we almost won. And so uh, I was looking to go on vacation, and Justin had somehow convinced um, Paul Graham to give him $50,000 to try putting a camera on his head. <laughs> and so uh, he and Emmett, another one of our Yale friends, were taking a road trip across the country to start this company in San Francisco. I wanted to go on vacation, so I asked if I could join on this road trip, and they said, sure. They didn't tell me that they had packed all of their belongings in the car, and so uh, if I were to take a seat, they would have to throw away 25% of their belongings, um, which they did graciously. And I asked, what's the plan? Uh, you know, we're taking a road trip from New York to San Francisco, and they said, we're going to just get on 80 and drive straight. And <laughs> that didn't sound like a fun vacation. So I planned this whole vacation. We met a bunch of Yaleys along the way. And when we came into uh, the city, actually, we got into town almost right around here. We stopped um, at Treasure Island to look at the, the city and the skyline. It was during the day. It was October. It was sunny, maybe 75 degrees. And the Blue Angels were practicing over the city. And I'm like, this is the best place I've ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> But we weren't going to live in San Francisco. Um, Justin had uh, a cousin in Mountain View, and we were going to stay in his basement, which sucked. So um, for the next week, they're working on Justin TV. I'm hanging out, and I thought maybe I should be helpful. So I decided to help them find an apartment, which ended up becoming an uh, apartment in this apartment building called y Scraper, which hosted... Airbnb, uh, no, I'm sorry, Dropbox, and a whole bunch of other YC companies. And I opened them up a bank account. And at the end of the trip, they invited me to become a co-founder of the company. And I said, no, because this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> and Justin, my dad says Justin's the best recruiter in the world. Because uh, Justin said to me, well, just think about it. And I can't just like look at someone in the eye who's just driven me to the airport after two weeks and say, no, fuck you. Like, so I say, I'm going to think about it. 
And uh, in the meantime, they recruited our fourth co-founder, Kyle, um, who happens to be the founder of a company called Cruise that just sold for a billion dollars. Um, and uh, they sent me all of Kyle's kind of elaborate drawings of this camera he was going to build. And I thought to myself, well, it's Justin. It's $50,000. They've got this Kyle guy. Emmett's a great programmer. This is pretty much baked, like guaranteed win. <laughs> so uh, I flew back to the apartment that I found for them. And within three weeks, I was sleeping uh, in the living room. And that was 2006. Yes. So, like, once I, I, you know, you had that fifty thousand dollars from Paul Graham. Had you launched at that point? Had you launched? No, we had everything? nothing. Okay. <laughs> so, like, how did you go from there to hey, we've launched a product to maybe talk about like, did you go back through Y Combinator and then? Yeah, we were program? completely dysfunctional. We were like twenty one, twenty two, twenty two, and twenty three. We knew nothing. We were really stupid. Um, most of the time, we basically had to build a camera, like a physical camera that could stream live video walking around, which was pretty hard. And then this website that could stream video. And none of the like tools existed. Like uh, AWS didn't exist. So we were racking servers. And all these other like CDNs didn't support live video. There's all these kind of issues. Um, you, there were no like, this was pre-iPhone. There were no like 3G cards. There was just none of the shit you would need to do this. Um, and so we started doing YC. Uh, I guess we, we all kind of moved by January 2007. So we were in that winter uh, 2007 YC class. And I remember that um, YC was a lot smaller back then. I think it was probably only 10 companies in our batch. And um, PG would call me once a week and say, why haven't you launched? And the team had four co-founders, and I was the business guy. And I was like, I have no idea. Um, I'm ready. These guys, I don't know. Um, and I'm like, why aren't you calling the people building the product? <laughs> and he called me. And so um, it was really funny because I later learned that was like one of the core pieces of YC advice. Like pre-launch, the only advice is launch. There was like no nuance. There was no like, oh, what are you going to do when you launch? Or like, how much press are you going to get? It was like, no. It was just, why haven't you launched yesterday? Um, and so we launched. Uh, and we launched by March of that year. Um, and that began a complete shit show. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. So when did you decide to sort of transform the idea into more of a, it became a live streaming platform for other people to come on and sort of live stream. When did you decide like that was the big bet? And then when did you go on to, you know, sort of raise venture and, and scale it into something a bit bigger? So uh, very quickly we learned that live video costs a lot of money. So we had to start raising money. And so we had to raise money from these people called angels who back, you know, we just kind of saw them as like rich people used to work at Google. <laughs> so uh, some of those people are now kind of, you know, big deals. So Iden Sank, it was one of our uh, investors. Uh, Paul Buhait, the inventor of Gmail, is one of our investors. Mike Maples, uh, partner with Anne, is one of our investors. And I think, I, I think we just told them we were creating an online t reality TV show, which is still a stupid idea. And I remember Paul Buhait said, basically, I just want to give you guys 25K to see, like, what will happen. <laughs> Literally. Like, this sounds crazy. Um, they all made a lot of money, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that gave us a little bit of money to operate. And we kind of thought we were funny. You know, like, we, like, would hang out in college and drink, and we, people thought we were mildly funny, I guess. And so we were like, oh, that'll really work, like, on a screen 24 hours a day. And after three months, we realized that's not true. <laughs> Nobody cared. And so um, we decided that maybe other people would be able to stream video better than we did. And because we had a very technical team of co-founders, and we were all equal co-founders, transitioning from a show to allowing other people to broadcast was extremely straightforward. I mean, there was work to do, but we didn't have to hire people or use consultants or any of that bullshit. So we got to work, and we started pitching VCs. And uh, it was really funny, because all the VCs said no. Um, I've probably pitched every single fund that anyone has ever heard of. Uh, and they all said no. And uh, we had a whiteboard in our office, which was also our apartment. And on it, it had these proposals of like what we thought these VC firms were going to give us. 
and had like the name of the fund and what we thought they were going to give us. But this was maybe a month and a half old because all of those funds had just told us straight up no. But we invited one VC to the office and we didn't realize that was still up on the wall. And so he thought <laughs> that we had offers. <laughs> so he gave us a term sheet. <laughs> And uh, so we raised uh, $2 million. And back then, $2 million was a Series A. Uh, it was two on eight. And uh, that got us started. Um, yeah. I, if I can communicate anything, it's like intelligence is not a big factor in this. <laughs> um, that comes later. Take that away. comes later. There's a lot of luck in the beginning. <laughs> Tons of luck. All right. So, uh, so fast forward a bit to... I think it's like 2010, 2011 time frame. I think you'd built Justin TV. You'd raise some more money. You built Justin TV to like a, like a real business. I think you were, you know, yeah. Like nearing so by then, um, you know, fast forward a couple years. Justin TV has 30 million people coming every month. Um, we're watching some ungodly amount of video. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of video views per month, and. Um, we're running low on money. We had raised a Series B by that point, um, and we're running low on money. And we're starting to slowly realize that no one will ever invest in us. And uh, actually, two companies uh, started talking to us about buying us. Um, one was IAC, uh, who uh, decided not to. The other was Google, who decided not to. And needless to say, both of those prices were way, way lower. <laughs> lower. Um, and with Google, it was particularly interesting because we had to send the whole company to interview at Google, which is really fucking weird to say, like, oh, everything's going good, but just everyone, we're all going to Google for the day to interview. <laughs> yeah, but it's, everything's good. And so Google says no. So now we're kind of in the shit. And so I remember we had two months of money left. We were burning $250,000 a month. Um, we were probably making 500k a month and spending 750k a month, and uh, we had 500 in the bank. And so we, uh, I had to kind of call this meeting, where it was like, "Hey, what's the deal?" And so, I remember this meeting. We, our office was like kind of crappy, so it was this like really shitty room with no windows uh, and like weird carpet on the ground, um, and it was really small. I mean, it was like like really, really, really small. And we had this like easel and like a, a shitty light. And I was like, so are we going to die? Are we going to reduce our burn to 100K a month so we have five months of runway? Are we going to break even or are we going to be profitable? And, you know, I knew what I wanted. But as CEO, it was like, I need to make sure everyone else wanted the same thing. Everyone says we want to be profitable. And I said, all right, well, we got to write down all the things we can do to make money and all the things we can do to save money until we have enough of these things. And so about two hours, we just wrote down everything. We invented new ad units. We figured out how to roll video ads out. Uh, on the other side, we cut a lot of costs. And then for the next month, we just did those things. And we told everyone, what everyone in the company knew the cash situation, and we told everyone if we became profitable and made over 50K of profit, we would take the whole company to Hawaii. <laughs> Seems like an easy bet. Um, <laughs> Within two months, we were break even. Um, at the end of that year, we had generated over $1.2 million in profit. Um, and we took the whole company to Hawaii. We took 25 people to Hawaii that spring. Um, but kind of having gone through that, we were actually pretty proud of ourselves, to be completely honest. We were like, you know, and our company was probably making on the order of 8 to $10 million in revenue. It was like, we might have a company. And this guy named Gideon Yu come, comes by the office. I think we'd only met with him a couple times. And back then he was working at Kosla. He used to work at Facebook and YouTube and everywhere. He's kind of a big shot guy. And he basically said what we had done was useless. Our company sucked. Uh, what we accomplished was nothing. And within three years, no one will ever heard of us. And we were like, oh, fuck, OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were pretty proud, like, the minute before he came in the office. <laughs> so we decided to start thinking about some new ideas. And we came up with this thought that maybe Justin TV and its revenue could fund 
internal projects within the company that could become the next generation of what we were going to do. So that was the beginning. Yeah, that was the beginning of everything. So what were, maybe talk a little bit about some of those projects, because I know that, you know, this sort of leads to uh, a change in direction for the company. Yeah, there were all kinds of projects. There were, we wanted to do deals with TV networks. There was, we want to do live event broadcasting and music broadcasting, yada, yada, yada. But two projects basically won. Um, one was Instagram for live, for Instagram for video, not live video. Um, because the iPhone, this sounds really old, but the iPhone, I guess, 3 had just come out, and it supported video natively for the first time. Um, before, we could only take photos with your iPhone. So um, we saw an opportunity there, and we saw Instagram kind of slowly becoming a thing. And then the other idea was to become a site for people broadcasting video games, which people had actually done on Justin TV for years, and we had just completely ignored them. So we basically split the company up into three groups, and we said, for the next six months, we're going to work on these things. We want to launch them and basically achieve this growth rate month over month. After six months, we'll see whether we succeed, um, and we'll kill the project that doesn't succeed. So that became Justin TV Gaming, which became Twitch, um, the website, and then Social Cam, the app. Uh, and now this is like when there's two versions of this story, right? So version one of the story is that both apps were doing great. So what do we do? The real version is that Twitch was doing great and Social Cam sucked. It was <laughs> horrible. Nobody was using it. Um, but it was kind of a weird point in the company because at that point we'd been doing Justin TV for about five years. And video gaming was really Emmett's, like, baby. Um, and, I, you know, I like games, but, like, I wasn't that excited about it. Um, whereas mobile was something that I was super excited about. So, um, yeah, Justin TV became a very different company very quickly. We decided because um, we had all had vested, all the founders had vested at Justin TV, and Twitch was basically just an extension of Justin TV, that we were going to spin Social Cam out of Justin TV. And Justin decided that he wanted to start another company. So suddenly, Justin TV is Twitch, Social Cam, and this company called Exec, which was like a TaskRabbit competitor. And Justin and I find ourselves in Y Combinator, uh, a lot older, a little wiser, uh, in the winter of 2012. Cool. So talk a little bit more about that transition, I think, from going from being an operator to uh, you know, a partner at YC, like, why did you make that decision? How did you sort of think about that decision? Uh, and then, you know, sort of what, what have you learned since becoming a partner? I didn't want to join Y Combinator, actually. Um, basically, what happened after I did YC is within six months, we had sold Social Camp for $60 million. And I was getting ready with my co-founders from Social Camp to start another company. Uh, we wanted to create something that was uh, going to be Palantir for the developing world, which actually that kind of company just went through YC, so I'm covered. And um, at that point, Sam was transitioning into running YC, and PG was stepping back. And so Sam came to visit me at my office, and he said, we want you to join YC. Um, and I had been a part-time partner. I'd, I had you know, time uh, advising companies. I'd voted on applications for years. Um, but I didn't really want to do it because uh, I had this cool idea for the next company. Um, but he started talking to me about how he was going to change YC and kind of what the vision was and how you know, YC up to this point um, had been kind of an incubator and you know, accelerator or however you want to call it. But he was trying to figure out how we can make sure YC stays around for the next 100 years. And uh, a lot of things would be different. Um, the equity structure would be equal amongst partners. And um, we would do, we would grow it, and try to make it better. And so I thought to myself, okay, well, I'm 30, because I was 30, 31. Um, sold the company, maybe want to settle down. This might be a better job to do with the family. And so uh, I decided to join YC. But I told him I couldn't start right away. Uh, because I had already planned a five-month trip around the world with my girlfriend. And so we traveled around the world, I got engaged, and then I started at YC. She was pissed because right around when I was getting engaged, I had to read YC applications. <laughs> and actually, right when we got married, I had to read YC applications too. So, 
So being on the, I guess being on the other side of the table now as a partner at YC and then having gone through it in the, you know, 11 years since, what do you think has changed most about YC? And then maybe talk a little bit about where YC is going as just like as an organization. I think the YC program that most people know now is for companies that are much later stage than it was when I went through. And to address this, we created another program called the Fellowship, which gives a smaller amount of money, but is kind of focused on earlier stage companies. So that's been a big change. Uh, it's certainly bigger. Uh, this last batch was 126 companies. Um, the alumni are far more useful. You know, we have 250, I'm sorry, we have 2,500 alumni now. And so just our alumni have done everything, and uh, that's extremely valuable. We invest in many different areas. So, you know, we were really software-focused when I went through. And, you know, now there's hardware, biotech. There was a satellite company in the last batch. There was a supersonic plane in the last batch. Cancer stuff. I mean, all kinds of stuff, um, which I think is really exciting. So a lot of changes there. And um, it's weird because it's... I think what I didn't realize when I was a founder was I never quite understood the feeling of being pitched. Like I was always doing the pitching. And like, it was funny because at YC, uh, I just finished interviews, right? So we interviewed 425 companies over the last two weeks. And so in a day, you just sit in a room and like every 10 minutes, a new company comes in. And I think the thing that I realized that I didn't realize as a founder is I didn't, most people don't know how to say what their company does. Like, just like the, like the simplest thing. Like, the first 10 words out of their mouth are not understandable by humans. <laughs> and it's crazy because it's like, you know, everyone's focused on, like, the buzzwords and the action verbs and the, it's like this for this. And I'm just like, I don't know what it is. Like, I, and I'm smartish, right? I mean... <laughs> I just don't know what it is. And so, so much of what we do at YC is just get people to, like, figure out how to say, like, what it is that they do <laughs> and, like, how not to use jargon. <laughs> like, and um, it's funny because during YC, we, we tell all the companies, like, two things. We say, one, there will be people in your batch. You know, there are about 350 founders per batch now. There will be people in your batch who will be in your wedding, which, like, no one ever believes us, but there were four YC people in my wedding, um, like in the actual like wedding party. And then the second thing we tell them is that you are going to become the 007 version of yourself. Like whatever you are now, like you're going to become the James Bond version of that. <laughs> and like part of that is like being confident saying simple things and like being confident not always like selling, like just describing and seeing if the person is interested. And um, it's so much fun to see that transformation because in three months, people go from just kind of being nervous pitchers to being more confident describers. Um, obviously, big theme of this conference is uh, changing face of tech and diversity. How does Y Combinator think about diversity amongst founders, amongst your groups? And then what are you doing maybe as an organization to invest in sort of encouraging more diverse founders to, uh, to build companies? Diversity here basically sucks horribly, and unfortunately, everyone is being compared to, like, the corporate folks who are probably the worst at it. So it's, like, weird, because YC numbers are better than Google's, but the Google's numbers are so bad, it's, like, how do you even compare yourself to that or Apple? Um, yeah, it's tough. So... Um, Basically, YC numbers are 10% of our founders are either black or Hispanic, and 10% of our founders are women. And um, a, a large number of our founders are international. Um, over 20, 25% are international. Um, basically, a lot of what we do on that front is making sure people understand the door is open. Because YC is already structured, so you don't have to know us. 75% um, of the companies that come through YC did not receive a recommendation we've never spoken to, we've never heard of until we read their application. And so it's already structured where it's not like you have to have a warm intro. But I still think people are intimidated to apply. And so um, we've done a lot of things around college tours. We've done a lot of things around what we call open office hours, where anyone can come and get office hours with us regardless of whether they're in YC or they think they're ready or anything like that. 
And then the other problem that we see in kind of underrepresented communities is a challenge in getting the first check. And so a lot of what we focus on in fellowship is you don't have to have anything. You know, we're writing a team, a $20,000 check, and they don't have to have any users or any revenue or any product. And um, we don't mind being the catalyst for those things being created. So, um, yeah, we're trying a lot of stuff on that front. Um, and I'm probably forgetting a couple of things. But it's, like, definitely shitty. I'll ask one last question and then open it to the audience. Um, so what are your, I think you touched on this briefly, but uh, maybe just what are your top three pieces of advice for entrepreneurs who are starting companies right now or who may be in the audience? Top three pieces of advice. Um, if you don't have a technical co-founder, I really probably don't want to talk to you at all. Um, the way you split the equity amongst your teammates indicates how you value your teammates, um, not who started first or whose idea was it or who gave the first 25000 So you really need to have a justification for why your equity split is, equal, is not equal or close to equal. Um, most justifications are not good. And um, you impress me with what you do, not your resume. So um, really, it's just about how much you've done in the small amount of time you've been doing your startup. Uh, if you need money or some outside thing to make your company go, then um, that's not interesting. Those things sound really rough. But like a lot of people used to lie to me when I first came to the Valley and do these things like, that sounds really interesting. Keep me updated. Or like, oh, that sounds like a really hard problem. Like, tell me more and then not answer emails. And like, what I always promise founders is like, I will tell you the honest truth. And like, if you know the bar and you choose not to meet it, well, then that's on you. Like, this is the NBA. Most people don't make it. Um, but we're not doing any service if we don't tell you what the bar is. That, then we're just liars. So that's the bar. Thanks. Any uh, audience questions? Uh, don't ask me hard questions. <laughs> got a question? Anybody got a question? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start then. So uh, Michael said that pitches are really important. You have to be able to pitch what you do in maybe the first 10 words. Who here said they have a startup? You have a startup? You, you, have, a, you have a startup? <laughs> Who has a startup? Your chance to pitch a white commentator first. I know Mike. All right, you know you have a first. Uh, this isn't really a pitch, but this is basically, Michael said you have to be able to describe what you do in 10 words. So if, let's say we're at a cocktail session or whatever. Uh, Martin, what do you do? Farago Comics is the first freemium streaming model for comic books, like a Spotify for comics. So I kind of know what that is, but I don't really know what that is. Try it again. Like, imagine that you were like, I didn't know what streaming was or Spotify was or any of those things. Boop, take two. Yeah. A free app for free comics. A little bit more. Ad supported to start, subscription based later. A lot of interest amongst Hollywood studios as a content platform that can pro um, provide great new content for TV and movies. Okay, so I don't know about that part. So maybe if I were to pitch it back to you, it sounds like you're building, is it a website or an app? Great, you want to say that. So you're building an app. Oh, I didn't hear that part, sorry. Okay, so you're building an app that allows people to uh, read comic books. Uh, for free? Yeah. Beautiful. And then, like, what's the business part other than it, the business part's ads? To start. What's it going to be? Subscription, rights management. Oops, sorry. Subscription, rights management. Subscription for who? Uh, readers. Okay, so it's free to read a couple of comic books, but then they have to subscribe. It's, right now it's 190 series and 600 books, all free. Independent creators, smaller publishers, a few larger publishers. We're in talks with some very large publishers. Okay. But we haven't really launched, we were in beta, but we haven't really launched for audience yet. Cool. So I think that like, that sounds awesome. I think that like, um, I always tell people like, for the initial pitch, pitch it as if you were describing what the user's experience is. That's like the best way of doing it. So like, an app where a user opens up their app, can read comic books and do blah, 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 blah. Like that's kind of like the most basic construction. And it sounds almost simple, but like, simple is fine. I'm a simple guy. Well, should we do another one? Yeah. All right, who else has a startup? You guys, this is your chance to pitch a startup to a room full of Yalies and investors. If you're hesitating, I'm not sure why. 
You're here. No. Uh, so, I guess I should also <laughs> mention YC is still accepting companies for this batch. So. Oh wow, this is actually this yeah. this could be real stuff here. We're making stuff happen here. Good thing you came here today. All right. Uh, you have a let's do like a what, a 15 second pitch. Go. 15 second pitch. Okay. What do you do? I'm um, Ashley. We have an annotation tool that allows you. What's the name of your company? Critique it. Sorry. Start with that. All right. I'm Ashley. Company's called Critique it. We have an annotation tool that allows you to embed audio and video and documents of any type and have threaded asynchronous conversations. Cool. Thank you. It's pretty good. When you say documents of any type. Yeah. Or I should say assets of any type. If okay, well, asset, that's even more confusing. Um, <laughs> documents was good. Is there a type of document you think people really want to do this with? Yeah, our uh, primary user base right now is in education, so term papers, dissertations. We also work with three police departments. There we go. I would start with, I would mention that. Or maybe do like a, for example, for our example. current users are okay. yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Because documents of any type, like, that's like, um, one of the tricks here is like you want me to ask a really engaged question back to you, mm -hmm. which means I have to like understand exactly what you do and then care. And like with documents of any type, I found myself asking me the question, like, what does that mean? Yeah. And that was blocking me from like caring and asking question back. Because I was like, documents like, is it like Word documents? Is it news stuff? Like what what is it? So policy papers, contracts. That, yeah, agreements. so that's the kind of stuff where you want to put that in there. Right. Otherwise, that's very good. Thank you. Okay, yeah. And so, I guess the key bar should keep the... on getting higher. This is like <laughs> awesome. So from so far, it seems like make sure you say the name of your company. My company is X. Don't give them cheat. Don't give them hints. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to be a supportive. You're not really listening. Then, out. Then, uh... We'll just keep you on the hot spot. Uh, so we've had three white guys so far. We need some women and diverse people to do it too. <laughs> all right. So Matthew, um, what are you doing? So I'm the founder of RelationBots. It's an AI-powered chatbot that helps people improve their relationships. That definitely needs a second sentence. So I kind of get that. What's your second oh, so sentence? Good. Like, give me an example of how a person would use it, Do it. Go. during the day. So you can send a message to the bot, and it will communicate with you. It will learn about you, and then it will give you advice and feedback on your dating life and on your relationships and how to improve them. That second sentence is very helpful. That's a good one, yeah. All right. All right. Congratulations. That was a good one. Very, very compact. All right. Anybody else has a startup? Okay. Dora, could you stand up? You have 15 seconds. Uh, DearDrDora.com, a digital mental health startup that will teach coping skills that are as effective as psychiatric medications. I don't know what that means. Uh-huh. So try again. Okay. Um, a digital mental health startup. That doesn't, you don't need any of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, men, people come to health, your site and what do they do? Um, uh, people can access online communities, webinars, uh, uh, track progress through programs and It's like the one gaming. thing you want them to do. Um, learn skills to, um, uh, let's say, treat uh, their own mood or anxiety disorders. Through a survey or? No, through okay. um, learning, and instead of spending seventy billion dollars a year on psych meds. No, no, no. Okay. So, <laughs> no. no. It okay, sounds like sorry. you have a site where people come and they do activities that help They'll, them treat their anxiety issues, as opposed to using medication. Yes, and they'll. they'll and the if we were to say activities, and then we say, for example. For example, what are the three webinars types of and be parts of groups to support, support each groups, other. groups, webinars, and. Uh, and um, there will be a way for them to track their progress in learning certain skills. And uh, we're gonna make that a lot more specific. But I like the general thing, right? Site where you come um, to learn skills to help you treat your own um, mental health issues without taking medicine. We have like these types of activities, and then like you can go on. But like that is great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Good job, Dora. Yay. All right. Should we still do these? It's okay. All right, cool. Uh, Amy. Jesus, yeah. like I'm a machine with this. <laughs> so you've been doing this for the past two years. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Hi, I'm Amy Schuen. I'm the CEO of Nanoforma. Uh, we have a better way of delivering cancer drugs to tumors. H how? Uh, we use nanotechnology that's been just developed. Can't do that. Oh, okay. So that's like, we, um, <laughs> what exactly does it do you do? What exact? Don't say we use this technology. What exactly happens? 
Um, that's much more difficult <laughs> to describe simply. Um, we have a better way of uh, creating drug delivery products or drugs or drug loading. Maybe try this, like, uh, compare and contrast. So, like, are you creating drugs? Yes or no? Uh, we are attaching or you putting drugs into very tiny capsules that get into the tumor more effectively. That sounds great. That okay. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're like, make sure you that say that hard. <laughs> make sure you say what you do. Not you have all the people have these flowery words around them. Just get to the point. Uh, all right. By the way, like nanotechnology is like uh, we like screen for buzzwords like. Um, uh, machine learning, AI, nanotechnology, like all of those buzzwords, like we just don't care. Like it's like, like, and w when you use one of those buzzwords, the person listening to you, like if they're a really experienced investor, they'll just stop thinking for five seconds because they'll be mad. <laughs> so like you just don't have to say it. Like tiny capsules sounds so stupid, right, to an educated person, but like, it worked so yeah. well. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, we can do this some more. We can do some general questions. What do you want to do? Some more? It's, it's up to you guys. You guys, you guys want to do uh, general questions or more mini pitches? I think people question. 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 Okay. Um, I just have a question about. Um, we were talking about diversity, and this is a hard question. Um, I'm wondering if you're familiar with the studies done by the Harvard Business School and elsewhere where there were hit, uh, pitches done by men versus women and the voice was hidden and the statistics were um, stunning um, in, in showing that um, pitches made in a male voice, if the exact same pitch ma made in a male voice was accepted, I think 60% over um, w a woman's voice. Ditto, um, I believe, African-American pitches uh, with different voices and... Um, Basically, that's my question. What, yeah. Just sort of, I'm just interested in what your um, thoughts are about that and why, why you think that might be. I think we all know why that is. I mean, it's because sexism and racism exists in the world. So I think that there are like two approaches to it. I think there's a whole group of people who are trying to um, make sexism and racism not exist in the world. And like, I love that. And like, I celebrate them and I donate and I try my best to help them. And then I think there's a different group of people who are trying to help people succeed in a sexist and racist world. And like that's kind of where I operate. So what I tell all of my minority founders is like for your entire life to get to where you are right now, you've had to be better than 80% of the people in the room. And like actually if you're in a liberal environment and you're better than 80% of the people in the room, there's some benefits to being a minority. But you have to hit that bar. So I just tell them that's the bar. And like, it's not a foreign bar. It's not foreign for women either. And I feel as though what I tell them is like, no matter who's preaching meritocracy, that's not the world we live in right now. So like, hit that bar. 99.99% .99 of startups fail. So being better than 80% of the room is still means you're probably gonna fail. And so you have to be comfortable in the startup world with failure. That's gotta be something where you're just like, man, like those are, that's okay. Like I've got good backup options. So it's much harder question to answer, like how do I get sexism, racism out of the world? I do think if people see people being successful who look different, like that helps. And like I think that like the place that I'm in in this kind of world means that like I can help people succeed in this world, but I don't really have good tools to like force Sequoia to hire black people. Like uh, the press is really good at that. There are a lot of activists that are really good at that. I don't have the uh, ability to do that. I do have the ability to say to Sequoia, this is an amazing minority founder and like they're growing faster than everyone else in the room. They're smarter than everyone else in the room. We found them. You don't have to find them. We've already found them. You should fund them. So that's kind of how I think about it. But it does suck. The current state of affairs is not great. To like, totally agree. Um, and so you can either do a 15 second pitch or ask a question. Nice. Your choice. Yeah, okay. uh, general. Gen oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, 
Uh, I work at a startup. You tap a button and get a ride. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we already so, know who you are, Simon. Um, <laughs> um, I, uh, there's a general question, and I think it's something that uh, weighs a lot on the minds, especially of uh, early career Yaleys. Uh, we have a liberal arts background, and uh, probably like the idea of being an investor where you get to like, dabble in a lot of different fields, but the idea of being an operator and like startup founder where you do one thing for several years, and if you get distracted, you fail. That's very scary. Um, and what I like about your story is it sounds like you um, mm, fell, in, fell into entrepreneurship. Maybe you were sort of downplaying like your, your career. No, that's but, pretty accurate. Okay. So you, you fell into entrepreneurship, and it worked out, and now you see a lot of other like budding entrepreneurs, and a lot of them don't work out, and some of them do work out. Uh, so this is a nature versus nurture type question, right? Like, is it a you have what it takes kind of thing? What are some factors that can contribute to a Yaley who has, like, many different interests to succeed in doing one thing well for the amount of years it takes? I think there's, like, a... I don't want to generalize this, but I think that... Um, when I went to my 10-year reunion, I was a little bit surprised because Yale pitches that it's collected the best and the brightest... But I didn't see people, I saw extremely intelligent people, but I saw them when they were investing an hour of their time, they weren't producing, I think, the work that they would want to in that hour. And I feel as though what's weird is that, like, I didn't feel like I ever got any guidance on, like, what to do when I graduated. And I kind of fell into a startup, and then it was like, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And so I ended up working really hard on one thing for like eight years because it was almost about to die the whole time. And then it turned out that working really hard on one thing worked, right? I had a lot of friends who thought that their 20s was the time to discover their life and their world views and to taste a bunch of different jobs. But all of them now are like early 30s and a lot of the doors that would have been open to them were closed. Um, family, expenses, where they decided to live, like all of these things are a lot more, a lot less plastic than they were when they were 23. So I do feel like for folks who are at all interested in startups, the one thing I tell them is like start absolutely right now. And anyone on the liberal arts side is kind of in a shit situation because there were points at Justin TV where I felt like if we failed, it wouldn't be easy for me to find another job. I think anyone who's an engineer, though, it's like an infinite safety net. Like anyone who's a CS major, if they're not starting a company, it's just silly. It's probably like literally the revenue maximizing thing to do. Because even if the company fails, they'll get a better job at whatever tech company they want to work at afterwards because they've shown the ability to, to do all these things. For us liberal arts people, yeah, I mean, we chose the easy way, so it should be a little more risky. <laughs> um, I, you know. If you didn't have to wake up and go to Science Hill or the yeah. uh, engineering lab in the morning, so, yeah. It was, so. a lot e it was a lot harder. So, yeah, I mean, but to answer your question, I think it's that we're not telling people, like, there's no career anything at Yale. And so, like, you just kind of get out there and then you operate on, like, some of the same theories that you use to choose colleges. And then my brother's doing colleges right now, and it's, like, funny what high school kids think about college because they're just like, oh, that's not true. <laughs> but, you know, that's what they think. So, yeah, so I, I think that's kind of where I would address it. Like, I really wish there was a better way to understand the options my senior year past, like, oh, you should just go to this consulting <laughs> thing or this eye banking thing and hopefully get a job. Um, but it's hard for me to say everyone should go all in, right? Because, like, most people don't succeed. That's really hard for me to say. But if you want to do startups, it's not a kind of dabbling game. All right, uh, Kristen is an SOM grad who has a little company she wants to tell you about, or perhaps right, a big one. Uh, no, it's a little one right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a business plan right now is what it is. Um, it's called Outpost, and it's a seasonal pop-up hotel for outdoor sports enthusiasts. Where do you... So I, I, I like that description, but it definitely needs, like, a, the second sentence. Some fleshing So, like, out. I don't know what a pop-up hotel is. Yeah, so, so these are, this is a hotel that would be um, based on uh, mobile lodging units. So this could be like Airstreams, yurts, great. converted shipping containers. So I would use, my second sentence would be an example. Like, so for example, um, 
Uh, during the winter at Vail, we roll up a bunch of RVs, mobile rentals, da 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 da, and we can offer the ability for you to go skiing and pay much less uh, for your hotel than the other options, whatever. Like, but that's good. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a technical co-founder, or do you write code? Uh, uh, executive co-founder, yes. And what was the second question? Technical co-founder. Technical yes. co-founder. Oh, technical co-founder. co-founder. Not yet. Ah. I, there are many, many really smart people. I didn't know you were here. Hi. <laughs> we went to school together. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, who else? Uh, Brennan. You have a, I, don't, I don't have a pitch. Can you stand up, though? Uh, but I will stand up again. Um, it's good exercise. Actually, I did sort of have an idea of like a pitch ballet. It. Do it. Do it. Do it. Now's the time. On the That's fly. the best way to start investor pitch, okay. by the way. This is, I, I don't have a technical. I don't have a technical person, so I lose. I don't have any money. I don't have, no, but I do think airport parking sucks. And so, if there were like valet airport parking that went and drove your car like thirty minutes away, where it's free to park, and then tracked your flight and brought your car right back to you as soon as you got out, like Uber for car parking. What would you call that? Would you call awesome. that like flight car? I can call that. Is that what that is? Yeah. Oh, okay. You so do work that. With them. Uh, my question really was: uh, Can you? What was the other idea that you had that you couldn't do because you went to Y Combinator? And then, can you pitch that and Y Combinator back to us? Sure. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. Never Reverse pitch. Reverse pitch. You got three questions in there, yeah. Brandon. You're very slick. <laughs> so um, the idea I wanted to work on was I wanted to build software for developing countries to help them develop. And the idea is that a lot of people think people who run these countries are corrupt. But perhaps if they had a better set of software, a better set of tools, even while being corrupt, they would be better at running their country, developing it, and helping their citizens. Uh, and so that's why I call it kind of like Palantir for developing countries, because it's like selling software to governments. So that's that one. Um, YC, I don't know. YC, uh, it's a <laughs> shitty startup incubator. No, I mean, um, so YC is a three-month program that startups can apply to. And um, it mentors startups, gives them access to a huge alumni database, um, helps them fundraise, and then continues to support them uh, for the next seven to 10 years of their life. And we invest $120,000 in each startup and in return receive 7%. Um, For the startups that truly do well, we have a new fund called the Continuity Fund, um, which allows us to invest in them in the later stages. Woo! That's YC. (laughs) Nice. So you had the name, you had who the customers are, and you had the benefits. Uh, I've done this a couple times. (laughs) Tyler. Uh, I just want to run a pitch by you. So um, Trinity Mobile Networks is an app on Android and iOS that gives users faster, cheaper, and more uh, more reliable connections by combining Wi-Fi cellular and mesh connections to improve Wi-Fi uh, coverage and connectivity. It's kind of cheating because I know what your company does, but I, I did understand that very well. So yes, that's good. All right, that's it. Up. All right, cool. All right, you want to do another one? Uh, okay. <laughs> but to say, if you're pitching a different startup, that would be very weird. <laughs> <laughs> Um, So I'm from the Bay Area, and you guys are way too successful at what you do, and your companies have raised way too much money, and you're paying your employees way too much, and rent is super high, and you guys just launched a really interesting program on universal basic income. Uh, I'd be curious to just hear more about that, why you guys decided that you wanted to do that, and um, how you have observed and your, your perspective on how San Francisco has evolved over time and uh, what we can do to be better and to make it more diverse and inclusive. So I might blame like Google and Apple and those guys. But I guess we might have a part in that. Um, so part of why Combinator's goal is to kind of start to become what we would think of as the next generation of a university. And uh, it's weird because the core of it is vocational and not liberal arts, which I actually think something that Yale needs to really consider. Um, but there are other kind of parts of uh, kind of this university idea. 
And one of, the, one of those parts is research. And one of the ideas is that not only should we be supporting things that maybe can happen in the next two or three years, but we should be supporting technologies that maybe take 10 or 15 years, or experiments that maybe take 10 or 15 years to figure out. And so YC Research is supporting uh, a couple AI teams as a result, and also this type of project. And I think that in the way we thought about it was, you know, we're in the unique position to run an experiment in a non-academic setting, um, which means that like we can fund it and we don't have to deal with like university bullshit. So why don't we just do it? And then like instead of having an argument on like the philosophy or the morality around universal basic income, maybe we can also incorporate real data. Um, also, we kind of thought it'd be really cool to do it in America because universal basic income is such a weird thing. Like, if you do it in a place like Norway or Sweden where everyone basically is the same ethnicity, there's a lot more public support for helping someone who looks like your brother than there is helping someone who doesn't look like your brother. And so we kind of felt like it was important to get data here um, reflecting kind of the fact that U.S. is a different place. Um, so, yeah. That's actually every sentence I know about the project. <laughs> <laughs> cool. We have a question from uh, Rich, who is one of the chairs of uh, Yale Tech New York. Thanks for coming today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my question is pretty simple. What do, you, what do you think venture capital looks like in 10 years? Um, mm. What's going to change from you know, how it works all today? That's a, it's so much easier for me to answer how it's changed over the last 10 years. Um, so I'll give you two options. How about that? Um, I think either the trend will continue where VC funds get larger, have to write bigger checks, and end up investing later stage and a lot more money comes in with the smaller funds and angels earlier. So basically, it's like the removal of the Series A. Uh, today's Series A is five, 10 years ago's Series B. And so one trend is that that just solidly continues. And you don't see companies raising Series A's until they actually look like real companies. Um, YC, that's the experience for most YC companies. I mean, most YC companies will raise between one and $3 million from angels or angel funds. And they won't be talking to Series A investors for the first two years of their life. Um, the alternative is um, that these micro funds um, thrive. And the big VC funds see them as competitive. In which case, uh, in that case, the big VCs will want to come back, jump in earlier, start doing many more 10, 15, 20 million dollar valuation deals as opposed to the 40 to 100 they do right now. And then they have to figure out how to scale because fundamentally, you know, YC has to support hundreds of companies a year. And if you're in the angel game, you just have to be able to write a lot smaller checks to a lot more companies. The one reason why I think it's going to be very, very hard to do is because um, VC funds with big brands have a really big problem of selecting winners early. And so, you know, if you're an Andreessen Horowitz and you select Lyft in, you know, month seven, and that prevents you from getting Uber, you just kind of fucked yourself. So um, it's unclear how they're going to be able to figure that piece out. So if I were betting, I'd probably bet on, on A. I'd probably bet on VC funds continue to go later. Much more money comes in this kind of early stuff. That money is a lot more founder friendly, and basically most things die before they ever have to pitch a VC. I like that. Cool. Not because um, I don't like VCs, it's just that like, you know, the money is easier to raise, it's faster, they are less onerous terms, and like most things should die early. All right. We have just a few minutes left, so I want to actually go into a quick pitch round uh, of like one sentence, 15 seconds. Pitch. We'll do a lot of them rapidly, and then you can just do a couple words like thumbs up, like it, say more, whatever. How about that? Are there more people who want to pitch? Well, when I asked if there were startup founders in the room about earlier in the day, about two thirds of the people raised their hand. When it comes down to pitch, only like three people wanted to raise their hand. So I don't quite get the math on that. So I think if people are shy or just need practice. So anybody else want to want to pitch? All right, quick. Cool. I actually think you undersold what YC could do. 
So can I pitch YC? Just give your feedback on that? <laughs> Not sure how that adds any value, but by all means. Let's do it. Just curious when I do pitch. So my name is Davis. I work at Y Combinator. We help empower entrepreneurs to change how the world works by giving them mentors to guide them, the credibility to attract people to help them, and the food so they don't starve on the streets. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to do a quick pitch? Or just do one questions? final question. Or just one final then, question. Yeah. That really is awesome. That will make us all go, that was an awesome question. Okay, Matt. I like the pressure. Um, <laughs> so, okay. hey, uh, what would you invest in today? And both in terms of what's going to make you the most money and also what's the, what just should we invest in and how do we bridge that gap? So it's hard for me to answer that like with one thing. I think I'm like starting to, as I've started to invest more personally, by the way, YC investing is very different. You know, 6,000 companies, we just try to draw a circle around 100 and pray. That's YC. <laughs> um, when you have to put your own money down, then things start getting a little more interesting. And I feel like there are different filters and certain things get caught in my filters. So one is a FOMO filter. Um, if any of my friends start companies, I'm going to invest because, God forbid, they become billion-dollar companies and I didn't invest. Um, if I'd applied that rule for minute one, I'd be a thousand times wealthier right now. So that's one rule. Um, I think the second rule is, like, I do like startups that are doing hard technical things. Like, I think, like, the one cool thing that Elon Musk has done has been able to show you that, like, cool tech things can still be done in the world, in cars and rockets and stuff. So I, I, I like that kind of stuff. Um, There's kind of a general YC thesis around replacing the entire back office. Like everything that used to be Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, like that stuff used to be the modern stuff and the stuff you used at home used to be shit. And now that stuff just looks disgusting and the stuff you use at home is like super modern and updating all the time. And so I think that like all the back office stuff is basically uh, up for grabs uh, in a way that it hasn't been before. Um, what else? Um, the other is how I invest as opposed to what. I think what I've learned more than anything, I've gone through different cycles of writing angel checks. My current thesis is that if I'm not willing to put an amount of money in that causes me a little bit of pain, then it's not a real investment. And so I basically 10x the amount of money I invest per deal. And um, it feels like, it feels shitty. I mean, <laughs> it feels like I'm just throwing 10x of the money down the drain. But also, it like, I feel like it clarifies the decision because um, I don't feel sorry for the company. Like, I'm not going to invest $250,000 because I feel sorry for the company or because, like, I think it makes the world a better place. Like, I'm going to do it because I hope I can get that back. And so I think that's been a big change in my approach as well. Um, that's all I got. With that, I want to thank Michael for coming out to talk with us.